this week on CrossFeed. Hot Mormon muffin. How full is your quiver? Maximizing space. In the beginning, what happened? And get paid to go to church. Hello, everyone, and welcome to CrossFeed Religious News. I'm Pastor Dale Christ. <laughs> I messed up my own name this time. I'm Pastor Dale Critchley, Pastor of Shepherd of the Ridge Lutheran Church in North Ridgeville, Ohio. He doesn't know his, where he is. He doesn't know his name. It's, it's pretty sad. Hey, folks, I'm uh, Jim Butler. I serve as Pastor of St. Luke's Lutheran Church in Dedham, Massachusetts, and really welcome to CrossFeed News for this week. Yep, and we have, I haven't even told Jim about this. We have a special guest with us this week. <laughs> See? <laughs> Hi! Oh! I should have brought Mr. Moose with me if I had known <laughs> we were going to have the lamb. This is, uh, this is Bo, the, the sheep. He's got a, a sister, uh, named Peep. And, uh, but I, I haven't even met her yet. So, um, so Bo, um, can you uh, tell everybody about our, our new show? Yeah, it's called Puppet and Pastor at Preschool. Um, no, it's Pastor and Puppet at Preschool. Yeah, there's a typo in the feed. We'll have to fix that. Um, no, it it really is called that. Yeah. Anyway, each month we go and talk to the kids at the preschool at Shepherd of the Ridge, and we decided to record this so that everybody could hear the message and, and enjoy the show. And so it's available now as a podcast, and you can find it in the iTunes directory, or you can go to shepherdoftheridge.org slash preschool. Just look for Puppet and Pastor at Preschool. Pastor and Puppet at Preschool. Yeah, we'll get it fixed. Thanks, Bill. Hey, uh, what are you thinking about that? What are you? Uh, how are you recording? What are you using it to record with? Uh, right now, we're just using. We've got a, a VHS camcorder uh, sitting up in the balcony, and, uh, and then I've just got a, a headset with it, so it's not even plugged directly in. So, like the first um, episode is out there right now. It's it's just once a month, and it's um, it. The audio could be a little better. The video could be a little better. Um, I used a kind of quick and dirty compression thing to get it up fast. And um, I'm, I'm kind of, I'm going to make sure next time to use a different method uh, so that I can clean up the audio and, and the video will be better and stuff like that too. So, uh, yeah, nothing real fancy right now. Um, eventually, okay. we'll feed it directly into a computer and get a much... Uh, cleaner image and stuff like that. And, but it was just, it was kind of a last minute thing that I said, boy, you know, I'm doing these presentations, you know, I might as well, um, might as well record them and, and, you know, as a way to, uh, for one, just to share the gospel with people. Everybody likes a good puppet show and, um, and plus it would help people know what to expect at the preschool and stuff too. So, that's true, but you know what would really get 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 an audience if you paid them to watch. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> That's our segue to our first story uh, about a church out in um, the Lighthouse Church of All Nations, and this church is located in where was it located? Yeah, uh, oh, uh, it's south south side of Chicago. First located, uh, Pastor Dan Willis, and. Uh, <clears throat> he um, has been giving away free money in the church. Uh, so uh, they um, have done a raffle. Uh, you, I guess you get a ticket when you go in or something like that. And at the end, they r hit the number. And um, so far, they've given away $1,000. Um, and uh, if you... Um, I can't remember how much money. Oh, it's two hundred and fifty dollars at uh, the two sun at, at uh, two of the Sunday services. And if they play the theme to the Price is Right, you get five hundred. 
Oh. I've heard of contemporary Christian music, but that one is not the new one for me. <laughs> you think he's paying the licensing fee for the for the theme? <laughs> I don't know. Is Bob Barker coming in? That's what I want to know. I guess it's Drew Carey now. Drew Carey but. now, yeah. But um, so okay, I I immediately went. Okay, I can see the whole given. We've talked about churches where they say, uh, you know, put into the plate if you need, if you if you can, and and take out of the plate if you need it, and stuff like that. Um, and and that I, you know, that I think is really cool. A raffle, you know, raffles always make me a little uncomfortable. Um, just the, I I don't think gambling is sin in and of itself. But I don't think it's necessarily good stewardship, and um, you know, and and when you've got people there, you know, they're saying, "Well, this is really popular during a um, a recession," you know. Well, yeah, but is the recession really when you want to be encouraging people to gamble? I mean, that's when they should not be, you know, during. Well, you know, I don't know if this case you're gambling because you're not paying anything you're coming to the service i guess this is one time that the ticket's not going to say need not be present to win but anyway uh uh but you know they they do that doesn't bother me i think okay it's um not a bad you know okay it's gimmicky and he admits it's gimmicky um what i what bothers me is that the money's been as part of the sermon other topics for this month Avoiding debt. Uh, uh, debt is a spiritual condition because of greed. Many of the expenses to get us trouble aren't needed. Uh, and, you know, to help his members resist the temptation of credit, he put treaders in the front of this church. And more than 500 uh, credit cards have gone, gone through. Uh, the budgeting process and the wisdom of living on a spending plan. He showed he could increase his monthly income by $80 if he made coffee at home instead of going to Dunkin' Donuts once or twice a day. Uh, I've never gone to Dunkin' Donuts once or twice a day, uh, but that's beside the point. Uh, the value, I've always made my tea at home. Uh, the value of savings, uh, open some sort of savings account. Okay. Now, I'm looking at this. And I guess these are good, solid, valuable things to be told. Matter of fact, I've even think, thought about doing debt seminars at, at St. Luke's because as an outreach, because I think it's a topic that everybody, you know, struggles with. And it is. But there's no gospel here. No, not a bit. This is this is all, you know, ten principles for getting at it, and there's nothing, and 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 and, there, and that's probably all true. I mean. But this, but that's not what church is about. Yeah, yeah. This is the kind of information that I want to hear from my Thrivent representative, not from. Okay, my for pastor. non-Lutherans out there, Thrivent <laughs> is a a, a, a a financial services thing. I met with a um, a friend of mine today who's a CPA and money a financial planner, and you know he gave me some advice on on things to be doing to to avoid debt to and how to invest money properly. And I think that's all good stewardship stuff. I think that's very important. But I don't want him up in my pulpit doing this. Right. You know, you can get good financial advice from a lot of places. But you only get the gospel in the Christian church. Right. Exactly. You know, and that's something that um, somebody this week showed me a, um, a uh, you know, one of these, was it from the, was it Crown Financial Services, something like that. Um that it's this sort of Christian finances group. They've got like radio spots and all kinds of stuff. I mean, I've heard a lot from these guys over the years and, um, and really what they do is they, well, we take a biblical approach to, to finances and that, and we get all of our financial information and, and, you know, tips and stuff from the Bible. Well, you know what? That's not the purpose of the Bible. Okay, now this particular group is, you know, they're a financial group. They're, it's, you know, it's, um, it's some former pastors and that, but it's, it's a lot of CPAs and that. Okay, fine. But when you're talking about, um, 
you know, you, you can get information from all kinds of groups, but, you know, the Bible's main goal is not to help us balance our checkbooks, right? The Bible's main goal is to give us eternal life in Jesus Christ, right? This guy, I don't these, see any... Yeah, that, none. No, John says, these things are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. He does not say, these things are written that you may have good, sound financial advice and stay out of debt. Right. Yeah, and uh, what he says, uh, if he can rescue just one person from the economic disaster that's brought so much of our area to its knees, God bless him. Well, that's the the person writing it. But right. that's the thing. He's trying to rescue people from economic disaster. How about rescuing people from hell? Right. right? I mean, the, the only way you can maybe argue this is, I, again, I, I, I would do this as a Bible community Bible study or something, mm -hmm. you know? Um, to be a entryway into the church where we can now proclaim the gospel later on and, you know, to touch a felt need, uh, as a, as a, as a, as a, as, a, as an entryway into the church and two relationships and things like that so that we can have an opportunity to proclaim the gospel. But if it begins and ends with, uh, uh, let's, 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 uh, you know, shred our credit cards uh, that's not enough right right because you know if you think about it what's the message you're sending god will love you if you can balance your budget he may not be saying that and i i don't think he is although he is saying uh you give what you receive the bible says if you sow sparingly you receive sparingly if you sow bountifully you receive bountifully and he's talking about their monthly donations being up from uh 20 to twenty five thousand a week up to forty thousand a week Right. So they're saying even though we're giving away money, we're pulling in more, you know, than we're giving away as, as the difference. I mean, he says that uh, it shows that people want to believe in because their the tenants is way up. He says it shows people want to believe in something that they have nowhere else to go. Yeah, they want to believe in something. But so give them Jesus. What, the, what, what, do you, what do you mean? They, they believe in. They want to believe they have a chance to win two hundred and fifty bucks. That's what they yeah. want to believe. <laughs> the question is: Is when you stop doing the two hundred and fifty buck giveaway, how many of them stick around? Right. That's 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 right. that's exactly. the thing. It's what we need to. to get. You know what would really make the people want to come though? Some hot muffins. <laughs> All right, we've talked about this group before. Um, it's, uh, oh, what's the name of the group? Um, oh, Chad Hardy is the, it's a entrepreneur from Las Vegas. And, uh, you may remember the men on a mission, uh, calendar of Mormon missionaries minus their crisp white shirts. And, uh, and it was just, a, it was a calendar of these buff young men, you know, and it was just kind of poking a little fun but i mean the guy that made it was a mormon was a mormon i think he still considers himself one um but he was excommunicated for it uh and also uh he was supposed to receive his uh diploma from brigham young university and they denied him that too uh which that like I, i'm thinking if you want to excommunicate him for sin fine but his diploma but that's we already talked about that that's always bothered me, though. Um, so now he, he created a, a sort of follow-up calendar. He's the, the, There's three of those men on a mission calendars now, um, third year in a row. and But now he's got one uh, for the guys out there um, with a bunch of hot Mormon women. <laughs> right. Well, and, I don't know if these are necessarily hot Mormon women. Uh, actually, it's, it's quite a... Uh, uh, um, they are uh, a hot Mormon muffins, a taste of motherhood. Um, Twelve mothers who claim membership in uh, the LDS uh, in vintage pinup po po poses. Apparently, they, 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 I, w I wish we had a picture to, to look at. Uh, they said the clothing is, is revealing, but not necessarily. I, found, you know. um, I, I, I looked around to see if I could find it, just, just to see how risque it is. And um, some are more than others. But everyone's wearing at least a bikini, and they're the they're these sort of classic like um, it it's it's not like um, porn. It, I mean, 
it's it's these sort of like the kind of poses that you see um um uh, Marilyn Monroe and and you know these sort of 50s um uh, and and 60s pinup poses mm. um just sort of uh you know kind of teasing a little bit um but you know ideal really got it for the muffin recipes, <laughs> each month has a muffin recipe. So that's so guys, you can buy it. You say, I only got it for the muffins, you know, because it's you know it's, it's there. Well, um, those those muffins are there because of the pun. <laughs> yeah, I know, but uh, but anyway, so it but but the women are anywhere from twenty six to fifty three. Some as many as four children. Several stay at home moms. Others are students, real estate agents, cosmetologists, dance instructors. One is a former Miss Utah, another is a breast cancer survivor. So there's a, a part of the quite proceeds a variety go to of people. breast cancer research too. Um, and by the way, I'll, if for those watching the video, if you stick around at the end um, during the uh, outro music, I'll uh, throw up a screenshot um, from it's it's kind of small and it's not real clear, but I mean you'll get the idea at least. So, yeah. so uh, yeah, the, yeah, it yeah. says the cover um, woman, uh, her name is uh, Roberts, uh, Tammy, Roberts. Tammy Roberts. She's also Miss May. Yeah. And um, she uh, said that her turn as a calendar model was an accident. Last year, she read news reports about the disciplinary problems with the church and this guy. And she said that made me mad. I did not agree with that. And so she applied for the job on a whim after she heard uh, that a women's version of the calendar was in the works. So, yeah, she was annoyed by the whole thing and, and said, well, that's it. I'm protesting. So, you know, and, and actually, here's my question. All right, we heard that this guy was excommunicated. What about all of the people participating in this? Now, I'm assuming that their husbands went along with it. All right, these are all married women. Okay. And, um, you know, I, I don't know if I'd want my wife on a pinup calendar, you know, not one that's being sold to other men, but, um, I, are, th are these guys for participating in it being excommunicated or the, you know, the whole families or whatever? Cause I would think that, that they're just as guilty as the guy that's, you know, that's making, that's actually putting the thing together. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Obviously, they're just as guilty, and you know. But yeah, the question the, the question is is would they? Well, you know, I don't know. It's always easier to go after the guys, I guess, who is doing the pictures than it is to go after the guys who people are doing it. Uh, and I, my, I think the church is wrong too. I think it's. I I, I kind of agree with her. I don't see why people can't have a sense of humor. Right. Because the thing is, it's not intended to be. Uh, you know, your typical pinup calendar. It's it, the whole thing is done tongue in cheek. That's why it's got muffin recipes. All right. I mean, it's, it, it, he said he's trying to break down stereotypes of, of the, you know, sort of, uh, fifties style, um, woman, you know, just to, to say that just cause you're a Mormon woman, um, you know, doesn't mean that you're not attractive or whatever, you know, and, and he's just, He's just trying to make a statement with it. He's not trying to promote um, any kind of sexual sin or anything like that. You know, he's just saying, oh, let's let's just have some fun with this, you know, concept and and sort of challenge some of the stereotypes and stuff. And apparently, the Mormon leadership like the stereotypes. <laughs> apparently, they do. Oh well. well I, 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 I have to say, I was surprised that. Out of all of these families, up to four wi up to, or up to four kids. That's it. Those are pretty small Mormon families. Apparently, they don't belong to Quiverful. Yep. So uh, I saw where that is... segue was going, buddy. So uh... <laughs> oh, it's nice when we can coordinate these things. <laughs> yeah, I know. Um, uh, anyway, there's a um, group out there. Uh, uh, in uh, 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 called and they are conservative, um, uh, uh, probably fundamentalist uh, Christians, and they call themselves Quiverful, and uh, so they uh, uh, 
from uh, Psalm 127. Uh, uh, talks about children as inheritance and arrows in the hands of a mighty warrior. Happy is he whose quiver is full of them. And so these are people who have these large families, uh, up to uh, uh, 10, 12 children. Sure. Um, You've got one that, of them is Pastor that family, James McDonald's. What? There's that fam- this wasn't in the article, but there's that family. Um, oh, they keep showing up on like the Today Show and stuff like that. They, they had their own reality show for a while. It was called like 17 and Counting or something like that. Oh, uh, the Duggars. Yeah, yeah, the Duggars. You know, yeah. uh, I'm guessing that they're part of this movement. They're probably, probably. like the poster child. Uh, for the yeah, yeah. Um, although they admit, uh, you know, uh, uh, that because they have such a large family, they have gotten to do things that they never would have otherwise. And, you know, they, they, they're very thankful for, for the opportunity some of the stuff got got to do. And, yeah, they, they, they really did. They've gotten a little bit of a falling I thought for a moment you were going to say John and Kate with eight. <laughs> no, 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 no. <laughs> <laughs> Which, frankly, I had never heard of that show before in my life, and it was okay if I hadn't ever heard of it personally. I'd never heard of it. So, but anyway, back to this stuff. Um, yeah, uh, Pastor James McDonald, uh, is one of these people, and he's got 12 children aged 4 to 26. 10 children. Ten children, ages four to twenty-six. Oof, what a! Um, it's a good spread there. Yeah, and so um, now there's certain people that are sort of opposed to this whole thing, feminists in particular, because this um, these groups also tend to focus very much on male headship um, in Ephesians five, and. Um, Although not, you know, the problem that the feminists have with this, um, generally in my experience, is their understanding of what Ephesians 5 is all about. That it's not about the husband and the wife, the wife and, you know, you know sort, of, sort of being the, the drill sergeant, sergeant, sergeant of the family and, you know, the kids do kids do um, um, But, I, but I, I'm, I'm guessing, I'm guessing his wife not. is not. Um, um, and yeah, and uh, so... so you know, the, the idea, idea is, is that, that he, that he needs to, is to, um, to love his wife and to take care of them. And, um, um, you know, and, and they, they support him for him and she does that. That's the whole the idea. Husband's, husband's love your wife's as wife's love the church. You gave him his life is life for her. Which means it means your whole life, your whole, not not just I'm willing to take a bullet for her, but I'm going to dedicate my entire life to service her and providing for her needs and doing whatever it is that she needs me to do as a husband. And quite frankly, uh, the when I deal with um, with marriage problems um, with various couples, the number one problem, and in fact, I would even say that. Every couple that I've dealt with, as, as far as I can remember, their problem came down to a misunderstanding of this passage, or, or just, or not even, you know, under, not even being familiar, not necessarily the passage, but the whole concept, right? And, you know, whether it be financial issues, whether it be, you know, anything else, you sort of kind of start tracing it back to the root. And, and you end up at Ephesians 5 and say, all right, you know, what's going on here? Oh, well, um, you know, the, the money's not being spent the way it should be. Well, why is that? Oh, because someone's being selfish and not, you know, seeking the good of the, of the family and not seeking the good of the marriage and, and stuff like that. And, um, you know, and, and just all the different, um, issues that go on, really, they come back to this concept of Ephesians 5. And, but, you know, they, as soon as you say husband head of the household or something like, or head of the wife, they, oh, oh, well, that's, you know, that's so, uh, what's the word, anachronistic as they put it in here. Now, some, now, I think that's part of it. Some of them are a little strange, though. They said, uh, you know, uh, uh, you know, some of them are, uh, <laughs> uh, um, you know, Alan Carlson, by the way, now, he, who, who says, by the way, he's a radical secularist. Which I'm really kind of surprised at because uh, last time I talked to Alan Carlson, he was a member in good standing of the ELCA, um, and uh, that was when he worked for the Rockford Institute in Rockford, Illinois. Um, so I don't know if he's become a 
walked away from the Christian faith or not. Uh, but anyway, yeah, he, he talks about, uh, you know, race suicide, you know, that, uh, you know, there's, you know, the, the, the idea that, uh, uh, on the other hand, he says, uh, you know, the historic view, uh, Protestant and Catholic prior to 1930 was that contraception and abortion were compatible with the Christian faith. And we're starting to see some sense among conservative Protestants in America that that was the correct view. And I think it plays in the movement for larger families. Uh, I'm not so sure. <laughs> I'm not so sure it would be, um, you know, uh, I, I don't like that we're starting to see some sense. Um, I think that's that's being really insulting. And um, yeah, we're in trouble. Oh, I, I, th- I think it means some right sense that it was th- that it was the correct view, like just that they like the a trend. Um, mm-hmm. That now I've known uh, Missouri Synod Lutheran pastors that are against contraception. I've known. Uh, some Missouri Senate pastors who, you know, gone for the 10 and 12 kids. I uh, remember one of them, Al, actually out in Rockford, who complained that the church wasn't paying him enough to take care of all those kids. And I'm like, they didn't give birth to them. <laughs> <laughs> you know? I mean, uh, where does it say, you know, it, you know, yeah, you know, what other job do you do? You know, you have more kids, they automatically start paying you more money. Yeah. You, know, you, you made the choice to have 12 kids, guy, you know, and the church didn't. Uh, the other thing I like, by the way, in the article is it talked about 15 passenger vans and called them minivans. I uh, know those are full passenger vans. <laughs> yeah, it's not, not many about that. <laughs> right. And, uh, you know, and, but that also says it's kind of interesting that a lot of, you know, if you look at some of those churches, uh, there's several 15 passenger vans sitting in the, in the parking lot, you know, because it's several of these large families and things. But Yeah, that uh, really boosts your uh, church attendance. Yeah, to boost the church attendance. When hey, when we left Iowa, I mean, we've got a family of five. Took our three kids out of the Sunday school, and that it wasn't that big of a Sunday school to begin with. You take our three out, and you know that uh, it was a significant, uh, you know, dent in the, um, you know, and and we used to do foster care too. So we've had up to six kids in our home at any given time. Now, one right. thing that I, I, I mean, uh, one of the families that were there, I thought was interesting. They said they adopted kids from, 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 you know, and have foster kids and that kind of stuff. And I think that's really cool. Mm-hmm. But, yeah. All right. So a lot of people are against this sort of large family movement because they say, oh, well, there's overpopulation. You're being irresponsible and it's using up the earth's resources and all that kind of stuff. All right. That I completely disagree with. Okay. There's nothing wrong with a large family as long as you have the ability to take care of them. Right. And, and I, I think that there's something to be said for stewardship. Um, it's one thing to say, God's going to provide for me. It's something else to just sit back and wait for him to do that and not, you know, really consider, can we afford this and, uh, and that, and, um, you know, faith. Yeah. Okay. Um, but at the same time, having faith in things that God hasn't actually promised you, that's something else. Yeah. But a lot of times it works. Uh, you get hand me downs. You uh, well, you use hand me downs. I mean, uh, from one kid to another, um, and other people give you things and stuff like that. Uh, mm-hmm. I, you know, full disclosure, I'm from a family of seven. So okay, he went to my mom one time and said, uh, "God must have thought we were good parents because he gave us a lot of kids." <laughs> so uh, you know, um, so as. Um, so I, I understand what these, these, you know, I grew up in a large family. I understand where they're coming from. And I think a lot of extent it is a good thing. Um, yeah. Yeah, uh, so it, it can be. Um, yeah, yeah can, I mean, but, we, we would have had more um, than the three, but doctor said, no, that's enough. Um, and, uh, you know, it was a safety issue. In fact, the, our third one was um, kind of touch and go for a while. And, um and so, so that's why we got into foster care and, right. um, you know, there's just really what, what it comes down to is, is look at what can you do? You know, for some people, their calling is to have a large family for some people. It's, um, you know, maybe it's, maybe it's to do foster care. Maybe it's to adopt. Maybe it's to be involved in a program like big brothers, big sisters, um, you know, other people not so good with kids, you know, they just really aren't, you know, well equipped for that. 
and they're able to serve in other ways. And so really this kind of comes back to that whole concept of vocation. What's your calling? What's Who's God calling you to be and, and what's mm. he calling you to do and what opportunities um, is has he given you? What skills has he given you? Um, and, and how can you use them to serve your neighbor and to glorify him? Right. Well, you're talking about problems there that you took half the Sunday school and, you know, a lot of the church. Um, and you know what they ought to do? If you don't have the kids, you don't have the population, open your church up to be to rock bands and to um, organic food uh, uh, seller, sell, sellers. Yeah, I like organic food. <laughs> it's a sheep, folks. <laughs> Mooses are cool, not sheep. Anyway. Um... So this is a uh, Lutheran Church of the Messiah. It's an ELCA congregation in Manhattan. Uh, dying congregation, 17 members. And uh, the pastor, uh, in order to come up with some money, <laughs> basically to keep the place going, um, <coughs> um, put the um, building up on Craigslist and says, Anybody need to run space? I need to concentrate on a more scientific plan yep. for tomorrow night. And so he was thinking like maybe an artist or something because it's the, the choir loft and they've got this beautiful stained glass windows and stuff. And he thought, oh, this would be a really kind of a unique space to, um, you know, to, to just for a sort of quiet, contemplative uh, kind of work environment. And uh, <laughs> a rock band responded to the ad. <laughs> Yeah, we need some space. <laughs> and uh, so uh, they tried it out, and the uh, pastor was a little worried about the noise, but he said, well, all right, you guys can rehearse in the building. And uh, they brought in another band, and uh, there was a neighbor that complained about the noise. Uh, it was Brooke O'Hara, co-founder of the Theater of a Two-Headed Calf, when she learned about the band, she asked if her group could rehearse in the church's basement. <laughs> like, <coughs> what's all that noise? Oh, well, this is a group that's running out some of our space. Running out space? Oh, hey. <laughs> so, uh, you know, then they have other theater groups, and the past was working with uh, a concert organizer to put things, and then they put on an agricultural program with local farmers. Um you know, okay, I don't know. I I don't have a problem with renting the space out to make money, okay? And again, it, it just try to increase some of the foot traffic around here. However, what I do, I mean, his his things is uh, the creative and art, the creativity and the art nurtured here make the space more sacred and holy. No, they. The preaching of the gospel and the administration of the sacraments makes it sacred and holy. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and these are purely secular bands and, and, right. and all that kind in of stuff. Right, in a secular too. theater. So, no. And a secular community-supported agricultural program. Yeah. Yeah, if, if you're going to, you know, rent out your space, fine. Well, actually, they don't rent space. Actually, he was offering the space kind of for free. Uh, it says the groups donate part of their proceeds. Mm -hmm. Now, I just read, yeah, and so, yeah, it's not really a rental thing. So it's, it's kind of a cool sort of people helping people kind of thing. Um, I I was just reading an article, um, re like, with, within the past week or two. I um, can't remember where it was, but it was a link I came across on Twitter. But it was talking about... You know, how is your space used in your church uh, throughout the week? You know, and it was talking about churches where, especially a lot of churches nowadays don't have the sort of nailed down pews. They've got the chairs that you can, you know, stack them or fold them or whatever and, and shove them out of the way. And you've got all this open space. And so there's churches that do things like um, uh, allow that space to be used as a uh, blood bank for the Red Cross or... Um, 
or for other like counseling services or, or you know, or things like that. Kind of not other nonprofit organizations, um, you know, generally a for, um, you know, or at least ideally to be something at least somewhat gospel oriented. You know, I don't know how gospel oriented a, a blood bank is, but it's certainly providing a, a service to the community and stuff. And um, so I, I really like that idea. Now, our space, we've got a preschool, and that pretty much uses up our space. Um, uh, we, we, yeah, we, have, uh, we have a space to do it. Unfortunately, the American Red Cross's uh, Boston headquarters is about two blocks away, so it doesn't do work to do a, like a, a blood drive in our church because yeah. you know, everybody's just going to go over there. Um, yeah, we had and, the AA called me up. Um, uh, about a month or two ago and, uh, asked if they could use our space, which, um, apparently our church years ago was the first location of the AA meetings and they, they had their preliminary meetings there, um, which meant you'd have like 120 people at a meeting and, um, and, but this was when smoking was still allowed in the building and where you've got all these alcoholics that are, um, that are sort of transferring the addiction just to get off of alcohol. So they're smoking like chimneys instead. And, and they said that you'd like open the doors and set up fans and everything. And it was still, you know, really, really bad. And, um, and so they, I mean, they, they did fairly well, but it was just, it just kind of created some problems and um, just because of all the smoke. And uh, so they ended up finding a different place to go. And then, but then they called me up and they said, you know, can we come back? And, um, and we talked about it and, and said, yeah, as long as it's a, not a really huge group like that, because we've got the preschool set up and it really would not be feasible for us to take it all down and then set it back up again. We already do that once a week um, because we use the same space for Sunday school. Um, mm -hmm. But to, you know, to do, to have to do that multiple times um, would really create some problems and for us and um, make it very difficult. And, but, you know, we wanted to help out as best we can. Well, it turned out that I called him back and said, how many you got? Cause yeah, we could probably do it. And, and he said, Oh, well, um, we found the the congregational church down the street. You know they've got a lot of space, and we can have all the different AA groups in town can meet there. And then we've got it all in one central location and stuff. And so, okay, fine, you know. Um, but you know that's that's a great uh, you know something like that. Uh, we have the Girl Scouts um, use our space. Um, we had a 4-H group in there. I don't think they're meeting there anymore, um, but they used to meet there. Um, you know, I, I like the idea of, of service groups. And in fact, our, um, our, we decided that any of the groups that use, um, you know, given that we're selective about who we allow to use our space. Um, but you know, we told the Girl Scouts, for instance, if you guys, you know, we've got unlimited web space, if you want to set up, uh, or, you know, to use our website and have your own sort of corner of the website, uh, for your use, you can do that and we'll help you get set up. Now, it helps that the head of it is, um, of, of that Girl Scout troop also happens to be the, um, one of the church secretaries, you know. Um, so we're, we're comfortable with, you know, the Girl Scouts have a, um, have had over the years, a uh, bit of a reputation of being pro lesbian and, and some other stuff, but we don't have to worry about that, you know, since we know who the leader of this particular troop is. And, um, so, but yeah, you know, just to really to, to reach out and say, Hey, you know, what can we do to help you? And I, you know, I think, I think it's a cool idea to, and where you've got these little bands and stuff like that, that they need some, some space. You're not using the space. You know, as long as they're respectful of the space and that, um, yeah, I don't see a problem with it. And and for a church like this where you've got that few members, um, you know, you're. I mean, the the financial problems are a reality, and you've got to come up with a way to deal with it. It's you know, <clears throat> it's it's what I often call my congregation. It's an evangelism of presence. 
Mm-hmm. They know where you are. They know the church. We have an Al Anon group. They get to know me. We have a uh, Cub Scout group. I, you know, go down there and they, they just, oh man, that your place is just so fantastic. We love meeting there, you know, and they, they've had me come in and have the opening prayer a couple of times. And, uh, um, you know, so you, you, you know, you, again, it's, it's building relationships. It's, you know, getting people to know where you are and, and it's a presence thing. Uh, well, it's hopefully like... you, hopefully you can get to the point where you can begin to proclaim the gospel to them. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you know, part of it is just making people feel comfortable coming into your building. Yeah, I mean, the reality is we've talked about doing like a community game night or something like that, and um, where we want to invite the community come and you know play board games, card games, whatever with us, and just just as a purely social you know kind of thing, and and we'll we'll hand out some tracts or something like that too. But um, you know, the idea is just to hey, come and get to know us. But I said, you know, if we're going to do that. Um, really, we're going to need to find some kind of location that's off the property um, because other people just aren't comfortable. If they are not church people, they're not going to be comfortable coming into a church for a church, um, you know, function Mm -hmm. because they're going to feel like I, I don't belong there, you know? And, um, so, so I said, you know, we should do that. But we should also make a point of finding some neutral space to do it and then just focus instead of connecting people um, at that point with with that kind of activity, instead of connecting them with the property, connect them with the people instead. But you could also, you know, go the other way if you have a way to connect them with the property, um, you know. Remember, the the property is not the church. The people are the church, okay? But if you can make them comfortable with being on the property, being in the building, you've overcome a hurdle. And then when someone says, hey, why don't you come on Sunday morning, come and, you know, and, and check out what we do here on Sunday morning, they're not going to be as reluctant because they're already comfortable in the space. I am wondering, why are you here? So, yeah, and uh, I mean, that's a great opportunity right there, too. You know, it, it just, mm-hmm. and also it sends a message we care about the community. And and that's an important message for churches to send. It is. Because you know why you know why we care about the community? Because it's part of God's creation. No, it's Maybe. part of his separation. Yes. Oh wait. That doesn't make any sense. Okay. <laughs> now this is inter- this is uh 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 <clears throat> there's a Hebrew scholar, her name is uh Professor Ellen von Wold. <laughs> and she says that the first sentence of Genesis is mistranslated. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Now, by the way, uh, um, I've heard that you know that the Tanakh, the Jewish translation, translates that when God began creating, He made the heavens and the earth. It still um, doesn't. And uh, instead of, and we translate the second verse: the Spirit of God hovered over the face of the waters. They translated, "A mighty wind blew over the face of the waters." Um, however, she said that that would be a wrong translation too. Uh, instead of um, uh, um, instead of uh, to create the Hebrew word there is bara, and she says it really should not mean create; it should mean spatially separate. Um, she's basically buying to the evolu- uh, 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 evolutionist belief, evolutionist belief that matter is eternal. And uh, therefore, what God did not God did not create it. God merely separated the water from the water. Isn't that bizarre? Well, I matter mean, is eternal. All right. So, where did the matter come from? It's just always existed. Then we come along and say God is eternal. Right. And they say where does well, that's come from? They, well, he's always. But that's why they, they they realize it can't be eternal. That's why they come up with the Big Bang and try to figure that out. Which but, doesn't. It just pushes it back. <laughs> it right. doesn't solve it. Where it came come from? Well, that's why some of they say where it's an oscillating universe. It expands, then contracts, and then booms again. So, yeah, except um, for the fact that that's everything's a, accelerating right now instead of slowing down. But that's another issue. <laughs> yeah, that's a. Um, I, I love her because she, she says, uh, 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 you know, uh, uh, what she's doing. Secondly, she's comparing scripture to the other ancient texts. Uh, that's be like Pritchard's uh, ancient Near Eastern texts, and she says, you know, according to other ancient Near Eastern texts, 
Uh, there was an enormous body of water in which monsters were living, covered in darkness, and that's the picture the Bible also has at the beginning. I got a bad feeling about this. Now, I I decided, okay, let's let's give this a shot. All right, let's let's actually look up. I, I looked up the word bara, um, as it's used in the Bible. Um, it appears forty six times in the Old Testament, and um, so I looked at all of the uses. Okay, and and one of the things that she pointed out is a lot of times where you see this term, it's there's this this duality. There's there's two things. So you've got, you know, bara heaven and earth. Oh, he separated heaven and earth. He separated them from each other. You know, and stuff like that. And you see that over and over. You got the sea monsters and the birds. You know, and, and stuff like that. And um, and she's saying, look, there's this. It's creating this dichotomy. Well, that 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 duality. That's just a Hebrew concept. Um, that is used to depict um. Uh, sort of completion, um, or, you know, like everything, you know, d- d- you tell, a um, in, in the Hebrew, uh, structure, um, to it's, it's an idiom is, you know, say heaven and earth. That means everything. It's sort of like when they say, um, when Jesus would say the law and the prophets, he meant the whole Old Testament, which also would include what they would call the writings, um, and uh, where he doesn't say the law, the prophets, and the writings. Um, he just says the law and the prophets. That doesn't mean he's leaving it out. It's just, it's Hebrew idiom to use two things <coughs> to mean everything, the whole thing. Um, so, and, and here's the problem with using this word and, and translating it always separated. All right, I looked through, and there's quite a few places where you could translate it that way, and it would make sense, all right? But then you get to Genesis one twenty seven. God created man in his own image. He separated man in his own image. Okay, well then, you know, there you've got the duality, male and female, he created them. Okay, you could say separated there, but what do you mean we're... And it says it twice in the image, you know, God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. All right, so, so there again you have it twice. Uh, it's not the same kind of duality, but... What do you mean, God's? Im- Does that mean that God is both male and female? Now, the, our Mormon muffin friends would say yes, <laughs> but um, uh, this is—it just doesn't always work. And there's there's lots of other places um, where it's the sense of the word is not so much separating things spatially, but something new. Um, like number 1630, but if the Lord and, um, the new American standard translates it, bring up, brings about, uh, you know, creates an entirely new thing and the ground opens its mouth and swallows them up and all that's theirs. Um, but it's, it's, there's this new thing, you know, it's creation. It's, it's something new that's being created. Um, mm-hmm. it's, it, it doesn't mean separated. In fact, there's right. really, um, and I can't even remember where it was, but there's there's like one place where the um where it's typically translated separate or to to cut in half or something like that, and I can't remember where it is now. Right. Well, it, it, and she even goes as far as to admit, well, it technically does mean create. <laughs> uh, I mean, she even says that in the article. So, I mean, it's basically, you know. Uh, you, you, your trick would be to find. Yeah, I always get worried when you have um, something that has been consistently translated, not only into English but into the Latin and the Vulgate, into uh, uh, Luther in his German Bible, the and, Septuagint. Yeah, the Septuagint uh, in the, the Greek. I mean, consistently for thousands of years. If you you know, yeah, you talk Septuagint, definitely thousands of years. Uh, you know, translated with the word to create. And all of a sudden, in 2009, somebody said, wait, for 3,000 years, this has been mistranslated. Mm-hmm. Yeah, or 2,000 years, 2,005, um, somewhere in the 400. Yeah, but for, for the last, you know, couple thousand years, this has been mistranslated. 
Right, right. Yeah, in the Septuagint, it's um, it's uh, epoesen, poeo, to create, to do. Okay. You, know, you could translate yeah. it with that. You could do. You could say, um, you know, in the beginning, God did heavens and the earth. You know, but it's, you know, he was the active doing agent. But um, there's no sense in that word of separation, and and this dates back to before Jesus, in the flesh, anyway. Right. So basically, what we're, what we're you know the, the silly thing here you, you can't make this, the argument she's making, and uh, you know it just really scares me when suddenly you know here we are uh, and now all of a sudden you know oh, we've been mistranslating this uh, we need to change the translation and here's my argument for it I just don't think it works. Um, especially when you consider that the people who translated it into the in Septuagint were all Hebrews. Yeah. Uh, they should know what their own, the only thing means. Right. Um, you know, so, I think what but, it comes down to is any time, I mean, and, and Jim kind of already said this, but you, know, you, you kind of have to ask the question, okay, I just found this, whether it be a translation or an interpretation, you have to ask yourself, why has this not been the um the accepted translation how is it that for thousands of years nobody ever thought of this you know i mean really are you really smarter than two plus thousand years of um of scholarship you know i mean you know that's the whole thing with luther luther didn't have anything new you know he just said let's get back to where it was before yeah, he was right. Luther was never had an original idea in his life. He was just a um he was a total plagiarist. He just kept copying stuff out of the Bible. I think you know what the problem is just as well as I do. Oh, so, uh, Bob. Yeah. Oh, my own um um <laughs> my own, uh my own the other thing I have to argue with is here is that you know, one thing about being a scholar is you need to get your name out, publish or perish. Um, and here she managed to get, you know, her name out. She, she managed to, you know, create some controversy and, you know, and I, I don't know her. I don't know how good of a scholar she is, but it, it's oftentimes, you know, he's, you know, brilliant scholars have to have one really wacky idea. Uh, I can't, I think it was T.W. Manson or somebody like that. Um, I remember reading in seminary and argued that Jesus, that, that, uh, Palm Sunday was six months before the crucifixion. I mean, it just seems like, you know, they need to have this wacky idea just to, you know, stand out there. So, hey, we got some great feedback from YouTube. I, again, I mean, a second time, we've got good feedback from YouTube. This is really scary. Yeah, um, yeah and, it, and it wasn't uh, it, it wasn't from uh, Pastor Torkelson this time. No, um, I know. It's from a guy who identifies himself as President blah, blah, blah. Yeah. Which... <laughs> I like you, guy. I like that name. <laughs> um, so, anyhow, he he argues uh, last week. Dale, um, for arguing uh, uh, on creation, pointed out his digital walks, watch, which oddly enough, of course, you know, uh, um, Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy will say, "Why did they wear digital watches?" You know, I never, never understood that. But anyway, and so she pointed out that you know that it was made by people, you know, and it didn't just evolve. And he said. We know by facts that the particular watch is produced by this company, by these people. We can reach, search, and document that. Not so with any particular God, right? And, uh, President Blah, uh, you're absolutely right. Mm -hmm. Uh, traditionally, there have been, uh, two great arguments to, to prove the existence of God. One is from creation, and the other is from, uh, morality. Those are, you know, the, those are the, the two great traditional, uh, uh, things that argue that God must, that God sh exists. However, uh, you don't know, it doesn't, neither of that does it say who that God is. You're absolutely correct. Um, you are left with, okay, that is the difference between a creationist who will affirm in Genesis that God created in seven days and an intelligent design person it will say, I don't know who designed it. It could be the God of the Bible. It could be Hindu Vishnu. It could be the uh, flying spaghetti monster. I don't know who it is. I just said 
it looks to me as if there's a design here. Um, and, you know, and you can look at all the whole realm of religions and all of them affirm, yeah, there's something out there. The answer is the what's out there is another thing. And, and that's where, you know, then you begin to argue of, uh, of uh, the uniqueness of creation, uh, the uniqueness of, of what God has done in Christ and where Christianity comes from. Uh, but you're absolutely, you're absolutely correct. Yep. Yeah. And yeah, we can, we know from creation, from uh, morality, which is too big of a topic to, to really cover in depth um, at this time. But um, it's, we know that there is a God, but if you want to know who he is, then we would contend you need to check the Bible. And, you know, the question of why the Bible and not some other book or, or whatever, that's another big discussion for another time. Um, but, uh, and, and we would be, if you'd like to email us, podcast at crossbeatnews.com, um, we would be, we'd love to discuss it with you. Um, or if you want to, um, It'd be easier via email. I was going to say you could send me a note on Twitter. Uh, Twitter name is Crossfeed News, um, but it's it's pretty tough to discuss in 140 character slices. Um, so, but yeah, we'd love to talk to you about it and uh, or you know to discuss it uh, further sometime. Uh, if, if other people have questions about some of this stuff, please by all means get a hold of us. Podcast at CrossfeedNews dot com. I'd uh, love to hear from you. So, yep, um, lo- loved your comment, President Blah. Thank you very much. And forgive me for dropping off a couple blahs there, but you know it's it's, it's gets a little old to say the thing, same thing three times. <coughs> Everybody, thank you so much for watching, listening, taking part. Um, we we do it for you guys, so uh, we do appreciate it. Again, any comments always welcome at podcast at crossfeednews dot com. Yep. So good night, everybody. God bless. Bye. Bye.